Welcome everyone to today's webinar where we will be discussing the three fundamental capabilities of managers. I'm so pleased that you were able to join me today and I'm excited to share some information with you. Uh, the webinar is not planned to last longer than 30 minutes, so uh, so uh, I will commit to uh, keeping within that time frame. If we finish a bit earlier than that, I will take some questions, but if not, please uh, do uh, keep in touch um, through using the um, uh, the questions um, window on your screen. Uh, if you do have a question during the webinar, I will be monitoring that and uh, we'll get back to you with questions. If we're not able to do that within the 30 minutes, I will get back to you by email and we can either uh, handle the questions by email or I can, uh, or we can set up a call. So anyway, on to the webinar and, and thanks again for participating. I'm really looking forward to spending this time with you. Have you ever had a bad manager in your career? Take one minute now just to think about what, what is one word that you would use to describe why it was a bad experience? What are some of the words that might appeal to, what might occur to you? Might it be micromanagement? Might it be a bad attitude? Might it, might it be that they were arrogant or condescending, that they didn't communicate, that they weren't available? Uh, these are all different words that, that I've heard to describe why a manager direct report experience was not a good one. But why is this happening? I think that's the more fundamental question. People, in my experience at least, generally want to do a good job. They, they, they want to do well for the organization and, and they want to be respected by their peers in the organization and by their direct reports. So why do these things happen so often in managerial situations? Uh, managers are, are, are being pulled in so many different directions to do so many different things uh, that, that uh, often they can be distracted from the very important work that they have of actually managing their people. And this really does matter. If, if you look at the research that's, uh, that's in place, 70% of employees leave a job for reasons related to factors that are directly controllable by their managers. So this tells us that, that managers are in fact, and, and I've seen this in, in stated in many other ways and, and lived this as well, that, that the manager is the most important contact that an employee has in the organization. So if we don't get the manager direct report relationship right, we're not going to get it right with employees. And this uh, research for Gallup from Gallup is also very interesting. Work groups that are ineffectively managed are 50% less productive and 44% less profitable. So it's not just in employee satisfaction terms that this is important. It's also important in terms of performance for the organization and the ability of the organization to deliver against its strategy. Um, before I get into the into the heart of the of the webinar today, I, I wanted to go back to this what I think was groundbreaking research back in 1994. It was an article published by James Heskett uh, called Putting the Profit Chain to Work. He published it in Harvard Business Review. And this is so commonplace that everyone has heard of this uh, service profit chain. So employee satisfaction leads to customer satisfaction, leads to revenue and profit for the organization. So it's undisputed and, and there's been much research that has uh, reinforced this over the years, but it's undisputed that employee satisfaction drives the, uh, the lifetime value of a client. But what's not made as clear, and, and which is incredibly important, is that the employee satisfaction dimension in the service profit chain is driven by leadership practices within the organization. So, so uh, employees aren't just satisfied uh, on their own, uh, they're satisfied because they're receiving a good experience from their manager and the leadership practices in the organization are setting in place a context within which employees can be satisfied. So that becomes really important to understand then that getting it right with the managers, ensuring that we have managers in place who are capable of doing their work uh, and, and that those capabilities uh, represent uh, an ability for that manager to develop a trust relationship with their direct reports becomes really, really important. So the fundamental capabilities that need to be in place are generally not well understood and, and there are three of them. The first one is problem solving capability. So this is the ability of a manager to work at the complexity of level required by their position. 
The second is skills and knowledge. So what are the skills uh, that, that are required, what is the knowledge that is required for the individual. This is the area where organizations probably do the best job. And then the third one is application. So what is the passion for the work in managerial terms? What is the full, what is, what, what is the ability of that individual to fully apply themselves and their capability in all aspects of the job going forward? Uh, in the amount of time that we have available today, I'm not going to be able to go into this in a great amount of de detail. It could be a one-day workshop. In fact, it could be a one-week workshop on these areas. There, 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 there's a lot of uh, depth and learning here. Uh, so I, I did want to point you out that uh, on the website there is um, a section where we talk about the three fundamental capabilities of managers, and then there's an article that goes into more detail in, in each one of these. Um, so, uh, so I will give you uh, that higher level understanding um, today, uh, but if you're intrigued to learn more, do please feel free to, uh, to log in. I just see a question coming up from a participant asking to get a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, and absolutely, I, I can send that around uh, as, as soon as this, uh, this presentation is uh, finished and, and get that to you. So, so then, so 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 then, what what are we talking about then in terms of these three capabilities? And uh, the the example I like to use is the television show X Factor. I'm not sure whether uh, whether any of you would have. Uh, would be familiar with that show, but in it, it's it's a singing competition that uh, was made popular in the UK, and now it's 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 broadcast in many different countries around the world. And I was watching the show during auditions one week, and and in many cases, I saw individuals who had who had a wonderful capability to be able to to sing, um, but but for some reason, they just weren't able to to pull it together in terms of some aspects of, of the song. In, in other cases, people had the skills, they had the knowledge, they had the ability to pull it all together, but they just didn't have the capability, or I guess I might say talent to, to sing. So, so all the pacing and everything was right, but boy, the voice just wasn't there. Um, and but the third the third part and and even even in cases where people had both of those things the skills and, and the knowledge and and the talent it still didn't always come to come together um, but that third aspect was was the passion or or that real ability to 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 be passionate about about the song so it was when those three things came together it was their their uh, their capability to be able to carry a song it was the skills and knowledge about about uh, how singing works and and it was this passion about uh, about the lyrics and 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 the singing and and the career so those three things coming together are really the x factor and and in in management it's exactly the same thing effective managers need this balance of capability to work at the right level in the organization this knowledge of the skills and knowledge to be able to do the managerial work and, and really valuing uh, the, uh, the all aspects of management work so that they apply themselves and, and, and that they do it. So organizations need to understand this for, uh, for successful placement of individuals into management positions. So uh, what I'll do now in, in uh, the time that I have uh, remaining is walk through each one of the three of these. I'd like to spend a, a few minutes of, on each one and then, then I'll close it with a summary. So the first one is, is problem solving capability. So problem solving capability is the phrase I used to describe this. It was first uh, described uh, in the 1950s by Elliot Jacks and he uses the term um, mental processing capability. So mental processing capability is probably a more accurate term, um, but it, it carries with it nuances which a lot of people in today's language aren't comfortable with it. It has sort of this, uh, this, this sense of, of some kind of mental, mental capacity or, or the averse of that, which is mental incapacity. So, so I like problem solving capacity and by problem solving I'm not talking about uh, the kinds of puzzles that you can buy at uh, the uh, airport tuck shop for amusing yourself on the, on the airplane it's it's how do you approach your job overall in terms of understanding what the main deliverables that you have both in terms of your ongoing operations in the organization but also in terms of delivering everything within your department against the strategic objectives of the organization so it's 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 the sense of how do I I approach my work and what are the strategies and the mental horsepower that I use to apply myself to ensure that all of that work can be done. 
It's a little easier to, uh, to talk about what uh, problem solving capability is not. It's not IQ. Uh, you can be a very, very bright person. I've seen very well educated person that couldn't manage their way out of the proverbial wet paper bag. Uh, and it's not EQ either. EQ, which is a demonstration of a person's ability to interrelate well with others. So, so while that's important to management, uh, that's, that's not, that's not, that's not, uh, the driver. And then also productivity, uh, so ability to perform and, and to do work uh, is, uh, while important, is also not the driver of problem solving capability. So I think it's more important to think about this as intellectual horsepower, that ability to work at a complexity uh, uh, of uh, work in the organization that is required by the role. So, so to, uh, to expand on that a, a, a bit, then I'd just like to talk for, for a minute about complexity of work because that's, this is really important to think about it. If you think of a frontline worker, a frontline worker comes into work in the morning, uh, is assigned work, uh, does that work according to a procedure that is very well defined and, and, and taught, and uh, does that work to the best of his or her ability and, and goes home at the end of the day. So, so most entry-level work is, is day to day. Some might go into one or two weeks, some might go as long as maybe even up to three months if, uh, if a lead hand was, was training um, um, a, a subordinate position to do something. So, uh, so in terms of um, of this entry level work, it's it's very much day to day work, and it's highly proceduralized. When we move up one level in the organization and think about the manager of these positions, uh, that manager needs to to work at more of a diagnostic level. So understanding the work, uh, understanding the skills, knowledge, ability of the workers, uh, in continuing to improve the work processes, continuing to, to improve the workers. So this requires a diagnostic capability to really understand the work, to, uh, to apply a diagnostic skill to, to uh, come to underlying uh, uh, issues that might be, uh, might be impacting on performance and putting in, plan, in place plans to improve those. So that might go out three to 12 months, so, so maybe even up to a year. At the next level of the organization, a director, which is the first level in the organization where you have managers of managers, will really be uh, working out one to two years into the future, uh, needs to uh, manage a number of stratum two groups of individuals, uh, so people of that at the manager level and those groups working together. And then if you go higher in the organization, it goes out uh, more into strategic objectives and longer term change initiatives, which might go out in the case of a vice president, three, four, maybe even five years, and then higher in the organization further out. So, so as, as work, um, increases in complexity, you will find it higher and higher in the organization. And the, the key takeaway here is that, that this is the value added work of those positions. So if, if you think about it, a vice president is being paid a lot more uh, than a manager or a frontline worker, and they're being paid a lot more because of that increased complexity of the work. Uh, and 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 therefore the increased capability that is required to be able to deliver successfully against that work and to be able to do that work within the time frames that 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 are required. So, so when I when I talk about capability of the individual, then I'm talking about the capability of the individual to work and to deliver against that complexity of work that is required for success in their particular position. So you wouldn't expect, for instance, therefore, a vice uh, um, a uh, a manager of a department to be able to uh, be promoted to a vice president uh, directly, simply because they wouldn't have the capability to be able to do that work. So, so then in terms of capability of work, what it means is that the work at each level of a properly designed organization is quite different, both then in terms of the complexity of the work that's required uh, uh, to be done, but also in terms of the capability of the person to be able to do that work. So for a successful placement, the, ca uh, the candidate's capability must be matched to the requirements of the complexity of that role. Um, and this is really important and, and it's often ignored. For example, if, if there's a, a, a vacancy of a manager position, very often the, the successful candidate and the preferred candidate is the one that was the highest level performer uh, on the previous team. So they say, oh, uh, you know, you have, I have a director 
uh, vacancy, so my very best manager should therefore be uh, promoted to the director role. When in fact, if that person doesn't have the capability to work at the director role, they're not going to be successful. So in fact, uh, they might be the best performing manager role because their capability is ideally suited to uh, to doing that manager level of work, um, and and by promoting that person to becoming the director, you've uh, you've created your worst director in the organization, and and you've lost your best manager in 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 the one move. The other point I want to make in terms of capability, just before we move on to uh, uh, onto some of the symptoms in this area, is that capability cannot be trained. This is a maturation process, so people mature throughout their lives to increasing degrees of capability, and this is why you'll find some people that uh, that work and, and are quite content and satisfied and productive at, at uh, entry-level jobs their entire lives or at first frontline manager jobs or whatever. So people will tend to find the level in the organization where they have the appropriate level of capability. If organizations understand that, then they can do a much better job in terms of, of placement. What are the symptoms of a mismatch of capability? Well, if, uh, if an individual is over-promoted, uh, this is the classic Peter principle. So, so the individual is going to be promoted to their level of incompetence. In other words, they don't have the capability to work at that level. So they're much more likely to be comfortable working at the level below them. So they're going to be micromanaging their, their direct reports. Uh, they're going to be doing a lot of the work that could otherwise and should be delegated down. And it's an issue of cost. We're, we're paying in the organization this person a premium to be at that next level in the organization. But if they're not working at that level, then, then there's uh, money being wasted by the organization. Uh, if, on the other hand, an individual has higher capability than the position they're in, uh, they're, they're going to be underutilized. So, so the direct reports or team members in that situation may feel that there's too much distance. Uh, they may feel that they're being undermanaged. Uh, and, and there's a real quality issue here because very often a manager in that position isn't going to be uh, working down at the right, right level. So, um, so these are, are some of the symptoms that can be in place. They're often thought of as performance issues, when in fact uh, what, what they are is, uh, is mismatches between capability and the complexity of the role that the people have been uh, appointed to. So the second area is, is skills and knowledge. Um, in, in most organizations, the tools that are used to assess skills and knowledge or to describe the, the, uh, the skills and knowledge that will be needed for a position are experience, education, and competencies. So these are a good start, uh, and, and most of the thinking is, is, is appropriate thinking, but it's not sufficient to identify the requirements that, that, are, that should be in place for successful placement into roles. And, and there are issues uh, with each one of uh, these three in terms of, uh, of, of how, uh, how they should be defined. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. So, so the, 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 the best thinking that I've, I've found uh, in this regard is, is writing by uh, McDonald, Burke, and Stewart in, in their, their book, Sisters, Systems Leadership, Creating Positive Organizations. Uh, I have the... Um, their uh, their uh, reference on uh, on the website um, so they um, they they build on a lot of Elliot's thoughts they 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 also build on the thinking of of other uh, excellent thinkers in terms of organization design and and they they describe uh, in this area three aspects of skills and knowledge that are important for for placement into the job and they are technical skills knowledge and social processing skills so if we think about the, the, the typical education and experience aspect, uh, education will be a reflection of someone's ability to learn. So that may be helpful in technical skills, and education may be one indicator of technical skills. But education in and of itself doesn't tell you a lot about what are the actual technical skills that an individual needs for, for success in the job. So just saying MBA uh, doesn't give enough information to understand what are the aspects of MBA that are particularly important to this specific role. Uh, 
Similarly, with uh, with knowledge, uh, we we tend to ask for experience. So experience might uh, you know some will say I've done five years in this particular job, but that doesn't tell you whether they've done the same job over and over again for five years, or whether they've been asleep on the job, or or whether they've uh, you know been extremely good at the job and 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 uh, have learned as much as they can and are now ready to go on. So understanding. What is the knowledge, uh, which is really their ability to apply uh, those technical skills, uh, becomes really, really important. And then finally, the, the social processing skills, which is how people uh, uh, interact and, and what they need to be able to successfully interact with, uh, with their employees, with their peers, with other parts of the organization, with um, uh, with uh, with the world at large, if if necessary, so uh, so the good news in this area is that skills and knowledge gaps can be trained, but it's essential to determine what aspect uh, uh, might be missing between a candidate and the job. So therefore, it becomes really important to understand what the requirements are for for each particular position. So uh, the symptoms of a mismatch of of skills and knowledge. Um, the, the first and, and clearest would be that there's a m missing part of the body of knowledge that's required for that particular job, whatever that might be. So the person might have indicated that they have uh, education and experience that would seem to be suitable, but once they're in the job, you can see that they just don't have some of the knowledge that they should. They may be missing uh, some key understanding of the fundamentals on, on how to manage people. So there's not only the body of knowledge for the job, there's the body of knowledge around how one manages others. Uh, and that's not often probed to enough of a degree. There's an assumption that if somebody's a manager now, they, they know how to manage, and that's not often a good assumption to make. Um, other symptoms might be that team members are getting process answers instead of content answers, or team members are going elsewhere uh, to get help with uh, with tech technical issues. So uh, if uh, if managers are not able to, or frontline workers are not able to get the technical help they have, then that individual may not have had the appropriate background in terms of skills and knowledge. Uh, I did put a note here because general management, once you get to the vice president level or higher, uh, these are general management positions. So, so one wouldn't expect these positions to be expert in every one of the units that they are, they're accountable for managing because at that level of the organization, you really are more accountable for integration and, and overall process. But uh, where most of the workers are, uh, this absolutely applies. And, and then the, uh, the last symptom might be that managers are not well integrated into the organization or into their external uh, networks, which would show a lack of the uh, social processing skills that they should have in place. So that moves us on now to the, uh, the third of the fundamental capabilities. Uh, this is also described very well by McDonald, Burke, and Stewart in, in the framework in the book that I referenced earlier. Uh, and, and what this is, it's the effort and the energy that a person puts into applying the other elements of capability to their work. So, so how well and how much do they want to apply their skills and, and their knowledge and how well and how much do they want to use their full capability to do their work. So it's really a valuing of the key aspects of that job so that they that they really do focus in and, and spend the amount of time that they need to in each one of those areas. So, uh, so if, 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 uh, if there's a failure to recognize the significance of this application concept, then people can be put into positions where, where they're not going to value uh, and they won't be effective and, uh, and efficient in terms of the work that needs to be done in that particular area. So example, if, if you think of a frontline manager, and, and I see this in organizations all the time, where the very best worker has been apply, has been promoted to be the frontline manager. Uh, the worker applies because it's, you know, you get a management job, there's better pay, there, there may be benefits that aren't available to the frontline worker. It might be full time instead of contract work and so on. So, so the individual will apply because they're the best worker, they, they get the job. But if they don't, uh, if they don't value that work of management, uh, then they're not going to apply themselves to that work of management. So some of the symptoms might be that that instead of, of doing the managerial work they should be doing, they're, they're always on the floor 
solving problems doing other people's work because that's the work that they value. Or they may avoid the administrative parts of the job because they, they don't value that work, so they would rather be on the floor than, than doing the admin part, which, which is important to work as well. Uh, they may always be late with the performance feedback because, again, uh, if they don't value sitting down with their, with their uh, uh, subordinates, with coaching them, with giving them support, with giving them performance management feedback and so on, uh, if they don't value that, then it's always going to be the thing that's on their to-do list, but just doesn't get done. And they may be good at coaching because they do know and understand that work, uh, but they may not have development plans in place for uh, for um, for their workers because, again, they're not really thinking about it from the perspective of the longer-term management and improvement of the performance of employees, but more in terms of doing that work right. So this this example applies in a, in a similar way for all manager positions, and and you can you can usually fairly easily identify the managers in an organization that don't value management job because they're not focusing in on the management job. They're always on the road, uh, they're always on the floor. They they're not available to their employees. They're they're late with their performance management systems and so on. So in this area, it may be possible to train and coach people for shortcomings, or or it may not for. In some cases, it may be as simple that a manager, a frontline manager particularly, doesn't have the skills and the knowledge that they require for, uh, for frontline management. Uh, and as a result, uh, they're, uh, they, they back away because they just really don't know what they're supposed to do. So they focus in on what can be done. So by giving them training in that area, it, it, may, it, may, uh, it may help them. Similarly, higher in the organization, if um, if uh, a manager isn't attending to this work, say a, a director, if the vice president po points out coaches and performance manages that issue, it, it may be possible for, for the person to, to step up and to value that work in the way they need to. But in some cases, it's, it's simply a, a mismatch of, of an individual to a position, and, and the only way to resolve the issue is, is to um, uh, re re relocate that individual. So we're coming close to our 30-minute mark. Uh, I've got just a few slides left. Uh, in, in summary, uh, effective managers need a balance of problem-solving capability, skills and knowledge, and application. Uh, failure to get this right may appear like a failure of the manager, but it may be, in fact, a poor fit to role. So in fact, it's a failure of the manager, but it's because we didn't do a good enough job in terms of identifying what are the, what is the, what is the uh, problem solving capability level uh, requirement, what is the skills and knowledge requirement, and, and the application. Um, so, so the third point I'd make is, is that each of these is role dependent. So, so the degree of problem-solving capability, the types of skills and knowledge, and, and the nature of the application are all driven by the level of the role, which is the complexity of work, the managerial requirements of the role, and the nature of the work of the role. So, so understanding those and teasing them apart becomes really important. So the action plan, what is the solution? I have, I have two parts to that. The first part is that there should be a position description for each position in the organization that both describes the work, which most position descriptions are already good at, but it also describes the required characteristics for success to do the work. So what is the complexity of the work and the role, the skills and knowledge, and the application? And the part two solution is that there should be a talent pool review system in the organization that measures for each individual uh, the, their problem solving capability and their maturation level and, and when they may be ready to move up a level in the organization, the skills and knowledge that they have and that they can bring to bear, and the application or what are the things that, that they value. So if, if that is done, so if you have a good understanding of the requirements of the position, if you have a talent pool review system in place that, that identifies that for each individual, then managers of managers can be aware of these criteria when they are hiring uh, and, and can do a better job of, of, uh, of engaging the right person. Uh, the role of HR then is, is to recommend these frameworks for implementation and would have a role in, in monitoring their use. And the CEO should approve the framework and set clear context for their use. So for this to be uh, successfully used in an organization, the CEO really does need to make it part of the way we do business in, in this organization. 
Um, so, so that brings the uh, the formal part of that presentation to a close. I just wanted to uh, to end the webinar by just giving you a quick highlight of of the Effective Manager Survey, uh, which is now available for uh, for organizations. This is based on research that we did with the University of Ottawa, and I always recommend this as a starting place to to CEOs that are thinking of of uh, of undertaking a major change in their organization or trying to get a sense of perhaps why 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 things aren't moving just as smoothly as they could. So, um, so, um, so I have a separate webinar on this and there's lots of information available on, on the website where you can uh, download information if you'd be interested. So that does bring this to a, to a close. Please do, uh, do check out uh, www.effectivemanagers.com for additional information. Uh, you can also register there for uh, my monthly webinar, if, uh, my monthly newsletter, I'm sorry. And if, uh, if you'd uh, like daily tips on, on management uh, practices uh, and, uh, and uh, links to uh, interesting articles, feel free to follow me on Twitter. I'd uh, be delighted to see you there. And if you have any questions or if there's any additional information that you would uh, like about this uh, or uh, you want to chat about how they might apply in your organization, do feel free to either give me a call or to send me an email and I will be in touch with you. So that brings us to a close. Uh, thank you very much for your participation. Uh, for those of you who signed on uh, today and didn't receive the PowerPoint in advance, I will be sending that around to you right after this closes. Thank you very much. Bye. Hi, I'm Dwight Mahalitz, President of Effective Managers. Thank you so much for downloading the webinar. I hope that you enjoyed it and will find it useful. Feel free to check out other parts of the website for interesting downloads. Most are free, some are at a nominal charge, but I'm sure you'll find lots of interesting tools there and things that can help you be more effective. And in fact, that's what my job is. My job is to help you, uh, help your organization be higher performing. The bottom line is that I want to start where you are, understand your problem, and provide services that can help you solve that problem and implement a solution as quickly and as effectively and as efficiently as possible. Give me a call, drop me an email, I'd love to hear from you, talk about your situation, and see if there's anything that we can do together. Thank you.